There we go. Welcome to our reporter roundtable here on the Red River Farm Network, our chance each week to pull out the reporter notebook and take a look at some of the stories we've been working on. I'm Don Wick, along with Kara Hart, Megan Overby, and Randy Coonan. And rain, or the lack thereof lately, has been like a four-letter word, but uh, a lot of folks are, are praising it this morning. We've had uh, some nice general showers that uh, have uh, moved through uh, North Dakota and into Minnesota this morning, uh, a pretty broad system that went all the way from Manitoba down into Nebraska. Uh, Megan, you've had a chance to look at some of these uh, rainfall totals that uh, some areas got more, some less, but uh, again, a, a pretty general rainfall. Yes, like you said, Don, it seems like this latest system that moved through overnight was more widespread. Uh, but unfortunately for some coming a little late, that's a whole nother topic we'll get into. But uh, if you're up in the middle of, of the night, I know at least here, it was quite the light show that was put on. And I know they were talking maybe some severe weather in the far northwestern corner of the state. Haven't had the opportunity to talk to anybody yet about that. But regardless, uh, those are where some of the heaviest rain totals are showing up, uh, according to the North Dakota Agricultural Weather Network. That shows anywhere from two inches to 4.5 inches. I'm sure localized totals in some cases are much more. Uh, the winner of the heaviest rainfall award goes to Noonan, which is north of Tioga. They're reporting 4.6 inches. Again, I'm sure it's probably even more in some cases. And actually earlier this week in a different part of the state, they were in the same situation. Uh, Kidder and Stutzman counties were actually in flood, flash flood warnings in the middle of a drought, believe it or not. Uh, some of those rain totals in the central into the southeastern part of the state included Tappan at four inches, uh, over 2.5 inches at Steele, Jamestown, and Lisbon. Marion, North Dakota had over three and a half inches. Yeah, that system on Tuesday, it seemed like it just stalled right over that, like that Stutzman County area. And then, uh, in fact, it looked like it went back west for a while again, too. So a uh, very strange system. This certainly doesn't... Uh, Take away the drought issue, though, uh, that remains uh, top of mind for, for our growers out there. What, uh, what are you seeing as far as what uh, growers are talking about as far as farmers and ranchers with the dry conditions and, and now this moisture? Megan? Yes, well, um, certainly, you know, that is top of mind, not only for farmers, but ranchers as well. And I know one thing that we have been watching closely is that drought monitor. Um, again, I know it varies depending on uh, your geographic area. Gosh, it could vary from township to township this year. Um, again, 99% of North Dakota as of yesterday. So these rains are not included in these numbers. Uh, remains in some form of drought. 17% of the state still in exceptional drought, which encompasses central, north central, and west central parts of North Dakota. Uh, but there was a 9% decrease in extreme and severe drought categories. So, uh, you know, some rains uh, that we have caught within the past couple of weeks are starting to show up in South Dakota, a pocket of extreme drought remains in the far north central part of the state. And in Minnesota, 46% is in some form of drought. Uh, that is a jump in that general drought category of 33% from the previous week. And you know, we are hearing that from farmers in Minnesota when we do visit them. They had good rains to start the planting season, but now that dryness is creeping into parts of Minnesota along with Iowa. So uh, Frayne Olson uh, of NDSU Extension mentioned that yesterday in one of their agribusiness webinars that, you know, uh, this general region is a region to watch because it does vary so much. Randy, you and I were out on Tuesday with Crop Watch, uh, generally in that Langdon area, but those stands are just very, very spotty as you, as you get out into these fields. Boy, that's for sure. Uh, noticeably, um, especially the ends and the hilltops where things just tend to dry out a little faster anyway, uh, there's just nothing there. And then uh, the, the fields that we were driving by, especially the small grains, look really tough, uneven, very, very thin. I don't think anything stooled out because it's been so dry. So this crop uh, definitely is, is struggling here. Uh, I just got off the phone with uh, uh, Mark Schatz, who's out in that rider location, uh, north central North Dakota. 
and they picked up uh, about nine tenths last night and they uh, he said some areas north of town got as much as an inch and three tenths south of town only a quarter of an inch but he said uh, it'll help the canola and the soybeans but the, the small grains he said i think are done he was uh, out in barley fields yesterday or, or wheat fields even too uh, pulling up uh, plants, looking at roots, and he said a lot of them are crispy already. So he thinks that wheat crop or that small grain crop is pretty much done out there. So this rain's not going to help them at all. So uh, pretty tough situation out that way. Yeah, no doubt. We had a crop report out yesterday. Of course, we're all looking at that acreage report out at the end of June. But uh, yesterday, uh, supply demand report from USDA. Randy, they tweaked a little bit on ending stocks for both the uh, corn and soybeans. Uh, soybean probably. Uh, a little more disappointing for the trade than what had been expected, but certainly we didn't trade that uh, report very long yesterday. No, uh, it seemed like it was about a 10 minute report and then they went back to trading weather pretty quick. A little bit bullish uh, for the corn actually, bearish for soybeans, but uh, uh, just the small tweaks here and there, which is, which is expected. Typically this report's never a big market mover uh, because of that June 30th acreage report. And that's the big unknown. I mean, they can uh, put all kinds of numbers out they want to, but until we know exactly what kind of acres we've got uh, officially, uh, it, it's pretty hard to make any any definite moves here in this, in this market. So, uh, Volatility is going to be the name of the game here with uh, everybody uh, watching the weather forecast. So it all boils down to how, what kind of rains we get and where right now. No doubt. Let's look at some policy stuff. Uh, Kara, you've been following what's happening in the world of uh, D.C. And, and WOTUS, the waters of the United States. Uh, EPA making some, some movements on WOTUS this uh, past week. That's right, Don. And we understand that the EPA plans to reverse the navigable waters protection rule. Got some mixed feedback from uh, farm country, uh, Farm Bureau coming out with a statement saying that they were extremely disappointed uh, and noting that it was really an important moment for the EPA Administrator Michael Regan to be pivotal in his ability to earn the trust of farmers on this and other administration's priorities. Uh, I think a lot of farmers uh, this WOTUS rule is a big deal for agriculture and, and what happens next will be very important. And actually, this announcement came out about one week uh, after EPA Administrator Regan came to North Dakota. And uh, if you were at that round table or you heard our coverage of it, I don't know if you were surprised with the decision from the EPA to readdress the navigable waters protection rule. So what uh, Michael Regan was telling the roundtable, and I believe what he said before in previous instances in Washington, D.C., is that there were aspects of that rule, that Trump administration rule, that he believed were unlawful. Um, he also mentioned last week that he's a believer that, indeed, there is not a one-size-fits-all option. In fact, um, when we look deeper at what he would like to see improved on the Trump administration's rule, he mentioned there were some parts of that that don't offer protections to states with a different geography than a state like North Dakota. North Dakota was uh, been really closely watching this. So I don't know if I was surprised to see that this was coming because of that interaction that we'd had the previous week. It will be interesting to see, however, how the EPA handles this moving forward. And when we were at that event uh, in Bismarck last week, we learned that uh, there are going to be listening sessions. So the EPA is going to be hosting quite a few of those, including one in North Dakota. North, North Dakota Senator Kevin Kramer told me last week that it would probably be known, at least more details on those listening sessions, especially the one in North Dakota, maybe after the July 4th Independence Day holiday. So we may have to wait a few more weeks to find out a little bit clearer on the next steps of some of those things, but that's what happened with WOTUS this week. So <laughs> let's see what happens going forward, I guess. I'm sure we'll talk about it in future updates of our reporter roundtable. Last week, uh, Megan, we also talked about what was going on in the auction world. Uh, more cow-calf pairs coming to town. Uh, have we seen what kind of values we're, we're getting at the at auction with some of these uh, cow-calf pairs? Yes, yeah, so I know one story that's gained a lot of traction on our social media, airwaves, you name it, is uh, what's happening at Rugby North Dakota. And this really has been a team effort uh, with all of our crew to cover this because um, granted, uh, a lot of people have been alive longer than myself, but I've just, I don't remember anything like this ever happening. And, you know, last Monday, 4,200 head went through that barn. 
And typically by now they're going to every other week sales. They're not moving a lot of cattle. And a good chunk of those were cow-calf pairs. The barn manager actually told us that he had to reschedule ranchers for a different sale day, uh, as long as it wasn't an emergency situation on their farmer ranch. And so uh, we see some young three to six-year-old cows selling anywhere from $1,600 to 1850 at last week's sale. Um, several of these groups were complete herd dispersals. And already for this coming Monday, approximately 1,100 pairs already co-signed. And uh, pairs are moving in other parts of the state too, not to that extreme. Um, Dickinson had over 2,000 head sold, sell yesterday, including 58 young pairs, 61 solid mouth pairs, and 71 short-term pairs. Those prices ranging from 1,100 to $1,600. At Napoleon, uh, still a good run of feeder cattle going through there, 2,000 head. Uh, they had 500 plus breads and pears selling yesterday. Their market report was not available quite yet on their website. But again, we're seeing a, a lot of cattle movement for this time of year across the state. Yeah, and it's tough because a lot of it's just because of the drought and we're, we're being forced uh, to move cattle because of the, the lack of grass and such. The other thing we were uh, covering this week is the 92nd annual North Dakota FFA convention. Uh, Karen and I both had a, a chance to be in Fargo, uh, Karen more so than me, but uh, boy, I always love getting a chance to, to attend those meetings and it was good to have an in-person event once again. That's right, Don. I think a lot of the FFA members, a lot of the staff that work with those FFA members and those advisors and guests, all really glad to be able to get together and meet in Fargo this year for an in-person event. There were some changes with the convention, including the look of it. If you had a chance to go into uh, the field house on NDSU campus, you could see they've changed up. Uh, it's a very professional look. I mean, it always looked nice in that field house, the way they presented that, but it really looked sharp. Uh, and those students, those FFA members, really are the cream of the crop. There's some really, really um, impressive uh, FFA members out there. Had a chance to visit with a lot of FFA members this week whether it was through, I judged extemporaneous speaking this week and you could, um, there were some really good folks in that group. And then you got to visit with the Star Farmer Award winners. And then you got to visit with um, FFA members that were just there uh, to compete in a contest or FFA members that were running for a state office and just always a really great group of, great group of kids. So. There is still, um, I was just kind of asking around yesterday, kind of getting a sense of where we were on a shortage of ag teachers. There is still a need across the country for ag teachers, and they continue to see that in North Dakota, um, even as they add some ag programs. I think they were still shy. Uh, one guy was telling me at the end of the day yesterday, at least 10 ag advisors maybe, or give or take in the, in the state of North Dakota. There is still a need for folks to go into ag education it's a very, uh, a very promising field for a lot. And side note, just because you're an FFA doesn't necessarily mean you go into agriculture when you graduate high school or college, but it can certainly set um, those FFA members up for success. I want to thank our sponsors for coverage, including NDFB, the National, rather North Dakota Farmers Union, uh, Ag Country Farm Credit Services, Farm Credit Services of Mandan Proceed, and Nutrient Ag Solutions. So thanks everyone for allowing uh, us to go down and cover. Uh, Don and I were both there and uh, it, it is always a joy to be able to be around the future of agriculture and, and, and youth that are really excited about life. It was, it was interesting to note uh, with COVID and hybrid learning and everything else, uh, nationally FFA numbers, uh, membership is down, but here in North Dakota, we broke a new membership record. And you talk about the ag teachers, uh, Aaron Anderson, the state uh, FFA advisor, told me on uh, uh, Wednesday night, I believe it was, that um, that's really what's holding them back from even growing more. We got a couple new chapters. Some chapters went from one advisor to two or two to three, but uh, there's so much demand, he said, that uh, they can really see a, a trend continuing upward in membership. So that's uh, an exciting story here in North Dakota. I think we also, Don, saw um, the COVID story spilling over into some of the award finalists, too, um, you know, and then some of the state FFA officer team, too. I, 
they think there may have been a greater number or greater interest maybe if COVID wouldn't have been a part of that. And maybe supervised agriculture experience projects it, it may have looked at slightly different, but all really sharp kids and really great to, to kind of be in that space this week. So, and side note, I also received my honorary North Dakota FFA degree. It's a really kind of a cool thing. So uh, I never thought I'd ever receive an honorary FFA degree, let alone from North Dakota. And it's just a, a really awesome thing. So that is fantastic. Congratulations. Uh, and yeah. Red River Farm Network also is recognized for 20 years of support for the foundation too. So it's a, a great organization. I had a chance to uh, interview Dan Glickman, the former Ag Secretary this week. He's out with a, a new book. Um, so he's, he's out on the, on the circuit talking to reporters. Uh, it was just interesting to look back on his career. Of course, he was in the, uh, the Clinton administration. Uh, he talked like there's that the group of former Ag Secretaries, there's only a, a handful or so that, uh, that are out there. Uh, and he talked about his time with the late Bob Berglund, of course, uh, out of the Roseau area, and, and Ed Schaefer, former governor in North Dakota, how they used to, they traveled and been on programs in the past. They went to China together and such. Uh, it was just fun to hear Glickman talk about some of the things that, uh, uh, maybe it's inside baseball, but it's just an enjoyable conversation. So you can find that on our, our website here as well. Um, I think that's uh, some of the things we're looking at. We got more coming up in the week ahead. Of course, we always appreciate this chance to sit down and, and uh, reconnect and visit about some of the, the stories that we've uh, covered here this past week. Along with uh, Kara, Megan, and Randy, I'm Don Wick. Uh, that is our reporter roundtable on the Red River Farm Network. <laughs>